What's going on, guys? We just finished filming another episode of the Almost Made It podcast. This week, we had on our first ever female guest, professional footballer and Matilda, Alex Chidia. We spoke about her being the first Matilda to play for Atletico Madrid, how she got snubbed from the Matilda squad, and also her off-field philanthropy. Let's jump straight in. Welcome back to another episode of the Almost Made It podcast, proudly brought to you by Cultural Club. Bit of a break, but we're back with a massive guest. Uh, she's an inspiring footballer, passionate advocate for community and social causes. Causes. She's played all over the world. A Matilda, ladies and gentlemen, Alex Chidiak. Welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. No worries. How are you? I'm pretty good. A bit tired. We were speaking a little bit before about, about my morning, waking up to watch the Matildas game. 3 a.m., bit rough, but mm. um, then straight into training where I saw you, unfortunately. unfortunately Bad start to yeah. the morning. See each other way too much. Yeah, we do see each other way too much. Sometimes. Yeah, one one time we had a session. And I was like, oh, <laughs> bit too early to say. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's my <cool>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's kick it off. Yep. Where were you born? What was your childhood like? And why football? Deep. Um, <laughs> look, born in Sydney, I like to tell people that I was born in Adelaide, though. Um, yeah, very fond of Adelaide. Uh, but yeah, moved when I was three months old to Adelaide. Um, basically raised there throughout all of my childhood. Um, my mum's side of my family was in Adelaide as well. So um, spent a lot of time at my grandma's house. And basically, like, my dad, he lied to my brother and I that he was a professional footballer. Definitely wasn't. <laughs> 100% wasn't. But he'd always tell me stories about, like, so he's from Egypt, came over. He was like, oh, yeah, you know, when I was a kid, I was playing barefoot <laughs> in the sand. You know, he really embellished the story. Um, so my brother and I would always play barefoot. Like we would, you know, play barefoot on concrete, in the streets, whatever. Like didn't have to, but we just did. It was, um, it was a good time. <laughs> and my feet are pretty used to it, actually. Like yeah. I'd, I'd rather play barefoot. Um, but, yeah, like we just always had, you know, ball at our feet. So it was me and my brother, very competitive. Like we ripped apart the swing set put like a net at the back of it instead, um, would spend basically all of our time playing. And I don't know where the love for it came from, like, uh, but it just was always something that was part of me growing up. Um, and I was convinced because, I, I mean, I didn't know much about women's football. I was like, I'm going to play for Chelsea. I'm going to play with Drogba. What's happening? I'm going to the UK. <laughs> like, <laughs> like straight up, that's what yeah. I, I thought. Like I, I bought, like every year I would get a, the new Chelsea kit, I buy it from um, Lily White's in, in the UK. Like it had to be from the UK, otherwise it's not authentic. Yeah. You know, I was very specific with what I liked. All I would ever wear is football kits. Um, so I had an absolute love and passion for the game and like absolutely loved, you know, the whole family got around it as well. So dad's like a Liverpool supporter. My brother's Man United, I'm Chelsea, my mum's Arsenal. So it's a bit of a mix. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like top four for yeah, a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so very competitive household. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'd always get up and like watch all the games. So Champions League, you know, my parents would even go late to work. We'd be able to go late to school. Like that was a priority. Um, so that's just something that was, you know, part of the family culture in a sense. Um, and yeah, I never saw myself doing anything else. So I guess that's where it all started. Wow. And then... Obviously, you would have started in a club. Yeah. So, At what um, age? Yeah, a bit of an interesting one. So I first started with an academy, this guy that was from the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just because my brother wanted to do some extra training and then I joined along. So it was just me and two other girls at the time. Um, and both of them have played A-League as well. Um, uh, but yeah, we it was just three of us girls, um, but we were training with the boys and doing like, you know, every – every kind of technical drill you could think of, you know, like all the stuff that you don't really see in our system here in Australia, like all those fundamentals, just everything with the ball. Um, I think at that age was like really important. It kind of set me apart a little bit from the other players, but I didn't join a club until I was eight or nine. Mm -hmm. um, and then joined Croydon Kings. Um, so that's Polish club as well, which was cool. So uh, my grandma had pretty close ties to the club and we knew quite a few people, but yeah, getting to represent them, was cool. Played in the boys' team there. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, yeah. Um, I looked like a boy. Had a, a rocked a bob cut, <laughs> mate. Like literally rock, rocked the bob cut. Um, I think we won like one of the seasons. It was a great time, great experience. Um, but yeah, played with them like all the way up until I was fifteen. Um, but in between that, did get scouted for um, state teams. So. 
state team was a little bit different. Like we don't have, you know, these academies like they do overseas, Mm -hmm. right? So I got scouted when I was nine um, for the under 12 girls state program and that there's no tournaments and stuff with that. It's just a training program. Mm -hmm. So I was doing training with the boys throughout the week, training with academy and then um, training with the the state team. So it's pretty heavy for a nine-year-old. A little bit, yeah. Loved it. So <laughs> and then playing school soccer and everything. Um, couldn't get enough of it. And my brother was pretty much on the same path as well. Um, so, yeah, football every night. Did your brother, what's like the highest level he ended up? Oh, like he, up? honestly, I reckon he could have made A-League. Um, but, yeah, he got to probably like the NPL equivalent. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, yeah, there was definitely interests from um, some of the youth, like Adelaide United teams at, at one point. But... It was just timing and coaches yeah, and he yeah. kind of went the school direction where I was like, Didn't I'm going to drop out of school. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we went very different ways. Yeah. Um, but yeah, things happened for me like really quickly young. So getting scouted at that age, always playing with older girls, um, getting to go to, you know, first like scouting tournaments, again to represent South Australia um, in, you know, those state competitions and stuff. So I was getting a lot of exposure at quite a young age, like 10, 11, 12, and then made my first under 17 national camp at 13. So things just kept happening. (laughs) It was quite, um, yeah, quite a quick rise, I guess. You would have developed like a lot playing, you know, the big age gap. I think that would have been very beneficial. Did you find that helped a lot? Yeah, playing with boys and playing with that age gap. Like I think – it is so beneficial playing with boys. Like, obviously, they get to a stage where, like, yes. like even now, sometimes when I go join boys' teams, yeah. you've got, like, a under-14s. There are some kids that yeah, look, they, like, 20 years old. That's true. Like, it's, like, it just depends on where they hit puberty, right? Yeah. So, like, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was lucky, like, the team that I was part of, it was, like, it was still really good and competitive. And then it kind of became, like, all right, you know, even if they're technically not as good as me, yeah. the pace. I'm, like, screw you. Yeah, <laughs> screw yeah, you, yeah. puberty. Yeah. Um <laughs> But yeah, like I think it, it helped massively and then playing yeah. against older girls um, as well. So I think that's a, a definite thing that helped me is massively. When did it, I guess, start to become a little bit more serious? Was it, or was it always just like, I'm just playing football, I'm enjoying it? Or did you, was there a moment where you're like, nah, this is exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life sort of thing? Honestly, I don't remember making that decision. I think like that was always what I was going to do. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't like, okay, I need to switch on here. I was always really switched on and serious about my career but I do remember a conversation with my Croydon Kings coach at the time so his name was Scott Dakin um he was from Scotland and you know had like a bit of a a history back in Scotland like really good coach um and he pulled me aside one session with the boys and he was like you know because I think I was like playing a little bit like scared a bit timid it was Mm -hmm. when the boys were getting a bit older and I was like you know, a little bit more uncomfortable, had the bob cut, had braces. I'm like, this is oh, <laughs> gross. I'm gross. Um, and he like pulled me aside and he was like, look, like in a, you know, in a World Cup, there's going to be so many fans. You're not going to be able to hear them. You need to use your voice, like demand the ball. Um, and I was like, yeah, shit, you're right. Like I, I need to start thinking about that. And that was, I was like 12 years old. Um, and, you know, I knew I wanted to play at World Cups and play at all of those major tournaments. And, you know, I didn't think that there would be, Massive fans at the time. Um, turns out there was last year. But, um, yeah, I think it it just kind of struck me like, you know, the belief that coaches give you, I think at a young age as well, makes a big difference. So and yeah. in that really pivotal period, I had really amazing coaches, um, which I, I definitely miss now. Like I've got I've got a great, great coach with Victory now. But, yeah, some overseas coaches and other coaches that I've had, it's been – it's been tough. Like I think I was spoiled when I was younger. Um, but yeah, had a lot of coaches put a shit ton of belief in me. So that made it easier too. I, th- I think we had, point, yeah. we had a very similar, very, very similar for that a lot. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And you're a sponge when you're a kid. Yeah. yeah. So you, <laughs> yeah. you know, if you have someone that you look up to as a coach and mm-hmm. they're feeding you this information, they're molding you with good habits and yeah. you know, good mindset. So I think that's crucial. That's why I think a lot of kids, especially here, that's what we lack here. Mm-hmm. That, you know, coaching at a young age to really get the kids mentally right to then progress, you know what I mean? Yeah. When did the first professional contract come along? Like I would have gotten it earlier, but there is a rule that has to be 15 to mm-hmm. sign. Um, so I was training on with the, the A-League women's, um, well, Adelaide United at the time. 
And yeah, I was 14. I didn't like, and I was with the other girl that was also in that academy program. So like we pretty much went through the ranks together. Um, she was from Port Pirie. Um, so I had to drive two hours to training every day, like very committed plays like has just made over a hundred games for Adelaide United now. Um, but yeah, we grew up together and she turned 15 before me. So right before the season, whereas I was the next following year. So I couldn't be signed yet. Um, so yeah, I got to do, you know, train on with basically the promise that as soon as I turned 15, that's my, that's my birthday present, I guess I get a contract, (laughs) um, which is not bad. So yeah, had my first season, um, with Adelaide United and, you know, in, within that as well was under 17, you know, world cup qualifiers and under twenties as well made that. And, um, very shortly after Matilda's. So it was like all bunched into one, (laughs) (laughs) which is a bit crazy. Uh, Mm. but yeah. 15, all right. Yeah. 14, actually. Yeah, 14-ish, but yeah, 15. um, Do you feel like the age helped you in terms of, I feel like, you know, when you're that young, you're sort of almost naive in a way that you're just enjoying the ride where you don't think about the pressure as much. Do you think that helped you or you just, you had a strong mindset already at that time? Definitely had a strong mindset. I think it it did kind of like help me get to that point, you know, like me and and the other girl, Emily Condon, like we were very different than the others. We'd yeah. get to training early, do our extras, yeah. we're doing the extra training. Like we wanted to be part yeah, of, of that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, once again with the coaches we had, like they saw something in us and also like, you know, added on to that being from Adelaide, there's, no one makes it from Adelaide really. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was not a lot of people that we could look up to, to be like, oh, this is how they did it yeah, or where they yeah, went yeah. or what, you know, people to talk to. And Adelaide yeah. at that time, Adelaide United, on the biggest losing streak in their history, um, like coming bottom every season. It was just the run, like we were literally the running joke, right? Yeah. So um, I think, you know, at that time we had this group of players that were like becoming really promising and they're like, shit, we need to do something with this. Um, and they started putting a lot more investment into us younger ones that were coming through because they thought, yeah, these will be the ones that will yeah. um, then take over. But yeah, I... I was just very dedicated. Like yeah. I, you know, I was starting to be like, oh, I want to mm. go overseas at, at yeah. 15. Like I mm. wanted to have that like European lifestyle, You're I really guess. Really clear about what you want yeah, to do. Yeah, really clear. What, yeah. what were your team like, the teammates like at 14, walking into Adelaide United? Were they open to you? I mean, I know what it would have been yeah. like for us if we were 14 walking into like a senior <laughs> team, but were they pretty good? Um, yeah, honestly, like they were pretty good. It was, that was scary. Like, yeah. I'm not going to lie. I was very scared of them. Um, <laughs> And, you know, kept to myself a little bit. Um, but I think, yeah, when you're good enough, you gain the respect. I was going to say, yeah, you exactly. gain the respect and, from the future. Yeah, that's, and that's the thing I found in most clubs. Like when I've not kind of gained that certain respect, it's a lot harder for me yeah, to feel accepted from, from from coaches definitely. and teammates. And in that scenario, yes, it, it worked out well. But in other ones that I've faced, like not so much. And, um, yeah, once again, I think it was – good at that age because you could definitely get discouraged and be like, I don't want to do this. Mm. Um, you know, there's so many little points when you're kind of going through those ages, like you've got your other mates at school that are going to parties and yeah. start talking about kissing boys and all that kind of <laughs> shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I, I've not, I, I don't even know anyone. Like I, I just, <laughs> I come to training, like yeah. that's my whole life. You know, all my best friends are football friends and now I'm hanging out, you know, my teammates are now like full women, like they are yeah, adults, yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> mm. So I'm getting like this whole different range of like, you know, the, the people that you meet, you'd find that in teams, like you've got different backgrounds. It's so diverse, like yeah. getting exposed to that and also getting exposed to people from interstate and everything from all the like state trips and Matilda's trips and everything. You just have a different view um, and you have to pe- you have to pretty much survive like from the get go, learn how to adapt to new people. You grow up quick too. You would have grown up quick. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so then when did uh, Atletico Madrid come knocking? Yeah. So this that was – Adelaide, yeah? yeah? Yeah, yeah. I know. Like Adelaide to Atletico Madrid is not really a common nice. thing. Um, Probably the first one in history to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the only, only yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look, there was a moment where I thought Craig Goodwin could do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, so basically at that time um, – it's quite an interesting period. So I was one of the older ones now in the under 20. So I was 19 at the time. Um, I was very clear on wanting to go overseas. And I was probably one of the first girls in my kind of age group to want to go overseas. Like back at that time, obviously now it's so much more common. You got younger players wanting to go over and over and over. But 
I was kind of rare in that sense of like where I wanted to go as well. It wasn't the US where all the other Matildas were. It was, I want to go to Spain. <laughs> I was very particular about that. Um, so I got in contact with my best mate, Ivy Lewick, who's basically played everywhere. Um, and, you know, asked her if I could speak to her agent. She was like, yeah, sure. So I got in touch with her agent. He was like, oh, do you have a highlights video? And I was like, I'll get on to that. I made the weirdest highlights <laughs> video, like literally like me recording on my phone, like trying to make like an iMovie scenario, <laughs> chucked it on YouTube, sent it through to him. And then Atletico Madrid were like, cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it wasn't like they had scouted you know, me or anything. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> just interrupt me. Yeah, <laughs> literally just be like, there we go. Um, yeah. Like, and the, the video is still up there. Like it looks yeah. grainy as, as hell. Um, but yeah, like I think they saw a lot of potential in that clip and my my agent had really good contacts there um, and they were looking to obviously build their women's program. So I was like, yeah, as soon as I found out they were interested, I was like, there's no way, first of all. <laughs> um, but yeah, out of nowhere, they sent through a contract and I was like, fuck, I need to like That's on you. That get this translated. Sense. I need to sort it out. Um, and it was, at, it was at a time where it was right before, it's like maybe less than a year until the – France World Cup. So I'd been in a few Matildas camps and stuff, starting to get more game time, um, started a couple games. And yeah, I remember the coach at the time, um, he had to go, because there was a rule in our Matildas contracts that you had to be playing in a top five league and Spain wasn't deemed as a top five league. So they had to get approval from FA for me to go. Um, and at that time, I'm like the only player that's going to be playing in Europe. So once again, I've got no other Aussies over there or anyone to ask, like, hey, how's Spain? I was the first one to go. Um, but, yeah, I remember some Matilda's teammates were like, oh, like, you should just stay here. You have a better shot at making the national team, like making the World Cup team. And I was like. It's a big, one of the biggest clubs well, in that, the world. Yeah, like, but that, yeah. this is but the thing, we, though. Is it like, level they're saying? No. So the thing back then is, like, in Australia, everyone thought the U.S. was the top. yeah. And other than that, I mean, people were making it from the A-League, like constantly. You know, most of the Matildas were playing in either A-League or the US. And well, actually, they could do both because the seasons were, yeah, were shorter. Right, yeah. So that yeah. that's what everyone was doing. And no one had done something yeah. rogue and a bit yeah, 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 out yeah, of the picture. Right. In my mind, I'm thinking like like what you guys yeah. are thinking. You know, if like proper football fans, yeah. I guess, yeah. would know the history of Atletico Madrid, like – it's a no-brainer. Like Spanish football is yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. For me to go there as a 19-year-old, hell yeah, I want to go. Yeah. But people, yeah, in Australia didn't yeah. think that way. Um, Just out of curiosity, what what are the five top leagues uh, I, considered? Back back then it yeah. would have been Germany, Sweden, yeah, I was say US. Sweden, big, yeah. I don't remember the other two. But yeah, Spain yeah. wasn't one of them, and like now, obviously, it's, it's different. Like, yeah. of course, Spain, like, uh, Spanish women like, team is probably the best team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The best team. yeah, like I, I knew that they were going to win yeah. a World Cup. Like I was, <laughs> I was training with these players, and I'm yeah. like, this is ridiculous. Yeah, like what they're doing over here is so much yeah. better than everywhere else yeah. I've seen. Um, so yeah, like it was, it was a no brainer for me, sure. but it was a there was a bit of backlash, yeah. and yeah, obviously, I ended up not making the World Cup squad. I find which, that bizarre. Personally. Honestly, yeah. like yeah. I, I don't want to get into details, but then it's like this: we're talking women's football, and I just say no different to what happens in the men's year. Like, yeah, they're sort of just yeah. like it's so frustrating, you know, yeah. like as a player <laughs> because you see like the opportunity that yourself got, yeah. like well, you, you, you got, and like we haven't had that type of experience, but we've had similar experiences where it's just mm -hmm. like you expect them to help you try and take the next step, but yeah. it's like they're almost like against you. I I you know told I mean? my under 15s coach just, yeah, at Pasco Vale that. Me, that I had a trial in Italy for a CDR club at the time, and he the first thing he yeah. said was, "Why do you want to do that for? We're it's versing South Melbourne on the weekend." It happened at Brunswick as well. When we were and there. it's like, what do you he mean? Goes, you got to start <laughs> on the weekend. You're just starting on the weekend. No, I couldn't care less about the weekend. Yeah, like, <laughs> mate, it's about the future here. Like. No, mate, like, I don't know. You should be proud that one of your players is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Look, that's how I would see it if I was a coach. Mm -hmm. But I, don't know, I guess we see things differently. Has, yeah, I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. back to <laughs> yeah. So you ended up you ended up signing. Yeah, ended yeah. up signing. Um, and and yeah, head over there. And it's you know like I didn't know what to expect. Um, and the league there wasn't deemed fully professional. Atletico as a women's team were professional. Yeah. Um, but the rest of the teams, you know, like they they weren't as professional. Um, I would say in terms of standard. Like I remember being over there. We ended up having to go on strike to get a minimum wage for all the teams. Wow. 
So, like, that's kind of where the league yeah, was at and where we were training. It was the same complex as the men but <laughs> on, like, a really shitty synthetic pitch, whereas, like, they were training on the pitch that we played on as their training pitch oh, and then would the go training. to the Wanda okay. um, mm. and play. So, like, you know, you could still see, like, I mean, like, our <laughs> our change room didn't have a toilet door. <laughs> like, it was like it was feral. It was pretty yeah. bad um, at the time. And, like, since then they've built this big complex. Like, you can see the investment that's gone into it. You sort of paved the way. Yeah, you were one of those like I was, I guess, like at yeah. that weird point yeah, of like was. it's starting to change yeah. the way that they view women's football. Yeah. Um, and I mean, like at the time as well, they were reigning champions, and we ended up winning that season. So got to win the the Liga my first season, um, and I was really happy getting, you know, as a young kid coming uh, like from Australia going overseas, I was happy with twenty or thirty minutes a game and the odd start. Like yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought that's a success for a first season. Um, but yeah, once again, not viewed the same way by people that make decisions. Um, yeah, hence why it was yeah really tough to find out that I didn't make the. The World Cup squad, um, um, but yeah, I mean, like there was a, obviously a change in coach as well right beforehand, and you know when that happens as well, it's it's tough. But I was really happy with the decision that I made. Like it was it was friggin' hard. Like cool. <laughs> it was like a double edged sword in a way. Yeah. Because yeah. you like, do I go or and I got this and yeah, like I think you made it. Do you think you made a good decision? Yeah. Oh, because I understand. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, look, there was so many more like other challenges that you have to face. Like you're not you're not at home in your little comfort bubble. Like you're having to speak a different language, you're having to understand another culture. And then you're not necessarily playing all the time. You can't understand the coach, save your life. Like <laughs> there's a bunch of things that are kind of stacked against you and you need to to find a way to make it through that. And it was it was friggin' hard and it was lonely yeah. and you know, I had to really like consider, okay, what am I doing? Because it was like for me, I'm like, my dreams come true. And it's not how I pictured it would be. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's funny how that happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, crazy, right? Mm. Uh, so it was tough. It was tough to, to have that realization, I guess, so early on. Um, and it was like similar when I made the first Matilda's camp. Like, it's kind of like, oh, okay. Like, not what I thought or so kind of expected. your idol for the first time. Yeah, pretty You're much. Like, this isn't what I expected. This is not yeah. what I expected. It was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was a bit strange. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I... <laughs> I remember a phone call. So the the head coach at the time didn't call me. Um, I actually got removed from the WhatsApp group, and that's how I found out oh, that I Matilda's of WhatsApp. the yeah Matilda's WhatsApp group just that's got removed from it, and that's like how I found out I wasn't going to the next camp, which was the pre welcome camp. I was like, it's like cool. Um, <laughs> and then yeah, right before they were making the decision, got a call from the assistant coach, um, and he basically said, you know, you need to come back in and play in our future Matilda's program. But this is with like girls that are like 15, 16 years old. Um, they deemed that better than me being at Atletico Madrid. And he uh, literally said the words, if you <laughs> like, if you don't do that, like you're not going to make the Olympics either. So like took away World Cup and Olympics okay. in one thing. And then the next day I signed a, a two year deal with them because I was like, I, I don't understand. And they wonder what football's way it is in this country. Yeah, I don't know. I, I actually don't even know what to say. But yeah, well, that's the thing. At the World Cup, they ended up losing to Italy. And then came out in the yeah, I know, with that shout out. Um, but yeah, then came out in the media and was like, "Oh, we need everyone to go play in Europe." Yeah. And then everyone started flocking yeah. to Europe. So yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. they kind of needed like a change in perception yeah. of the rest of the world. I think they thought, you know, US is where it's at. Yeah. Like we've got something really good here. We've got these amazing players. Like, and then it was just a bit of a, a shock to the system when you know Italy, way, way, way lower ranked than us, come and beat us. You were the pioneer. Tried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know another thing saying about the WhatsApp, that's another thing people don't know, like see in football terms. Like, like that, yeah. Like imagine yeah. mentally, like how old were you at the time? 19. 19. Yeah. Like you're in the Matilda, like imagine like a socceroo at 19 yeah. just getting booted out of the WhatsApp. Like mentally. And yeah. no one's even No on one's said yeah. anything. You're like, what did I do wrong? And you start yeah. like passing out. Yeah. That's the type of thing that you deal with constantly on a day-to-day basis that yeah. people don't see. No. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know what it was like for you guys, but it's, it's almost harder when you just don't get – you ask for feedback, yeah, you don't get a direct the, thing. Like, I want yeah, you to just yeah, tell course. me, like, just what's work exactly. on. Definitely, definitely. Like, exactly. as a footballer, you want to just, like... You'd rather them be straight with you. Hell yeah. yeah. Like, so I want to then yeah. be able to go work on that, you know? Like, exactly. But if you don't get that, then it's... Definitely. You're just stuck. <laughs> you're stuck in your own head. That's yeah. what I feel. Like, <laughs> yeah. you just start making you start, things second, up. You start second-guessing, yeah. too, because mm-hmm. you're like, if I'm not doing that right, am I doing this right? And then it's like, what do I do, you just put yourself in a hole. Yeah. It becomes a circle. You chase your tail. Yeah. So what was a typical day at Atletico Madrid? 
Um, yeah, first season, uh, it was kind of funny. So I had an Italian teammate um, and she was designated by the club to drive this van <laughs> <laughs> and there were like eight of us in the van. So I had like my Portuguese teammate, a bunch of like the younger Spanish girls that couldn't drive yet. Um, and yeah, we'd have like a set time to meet downstairs in the garage or get in a van. She would drive us, um, get to the facility. It was like a 45 minute drive or something. Um, get there. We didn't really have like a proper gym set up. So it's not like in my mind, I thought it would be more advanced yeah. at that time. It wasn't for that first season, the next season. Yes. Um, but yeah, you kind of do, you know, whatever warm ups, And then like what I loved was the actual training sessions. Every one of them was different. So I can't run through a one training session cause they're all completely different, but mm -hmm. also the warm ups were all with the bowl. Yeah, Perfect. Yeah, so, <laughs> so good. So yeah, train in the morning. Um, we had to drive elsewhere for gym. So, um, get back in the van, <laughs> go to the gym, then get back. And then it was basically where we were living. Um, there was like a, a massive shopping mall kind of further down. So we get all the groceries and everything. So I would go to that shopping mall quite often and try and kind of immerse myself in the surroundings and like hear, mm. hear the language, get a bit more confident. Um, that first year I found it really hard to, to leave the apartment. I was quite anxious. Um, but yeah, once I got out of that little bubble and started saying yes to things and putting myself in a bit more uncomfortable situations, yeah, so much better and started going to the city. Like you pretty much train in the morning and you get the rest of the day. Yeah. So yeah, had to fill it up with stuff and yeah. you know, first season was lonely, but then the next season had a few more, um, English speakers that came and were all in the same boat as well. So we would also then have Spanish lessons added on and oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Do a bunch of different stuff, but um, yeah, a lot of a lot of Spanish learning in between. How's your Spanish? <laughs> Pretty good, honestly. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Trying to keep up with it as well, yeah, but yeah. but yeah. Um, so basically, just training, gym, explore a little bit Spanish, a lot of FaceTime, FaceTime my friends, yeah. family back home, be like, hi, <laughs> <laughs> what's you up? Hola? You say hola. <laughs> yeah, hola. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like that was kind of that on repeat, and I mean it's, it's similar here, like. Yeah, right. You know, um, nothing too too fancy, but yeah. You just, sorry, no, 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 no. Okay. I'll see you. I was just going to say, did you just play one game a week so, on the weekend or did you have midweek games? Well, yeah, when we had, um, so that was one thing I wasn't used to, right? Here you just have yeah. the one game on the weekend. But yeah, they had cup games and we had yeah. Champions League as well. So um, we'd have the midweek games um, and yeah, the travel for that, that's at that point, we would either catch a bus or a train most places. So like eight hour bus rides. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, That's not fun. Uncle for the knees. No, no. <laughs> not at all. So that was rough. Um, yeah, we pretty much, I would say that they fly everywhere now, but <laughs> can't be too sure. Mm. Um, but yeah, like we'd have the midweek games and I, like luckily for, for us being in Madrid, like there are quite a few teams from Madrid. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, easy drive. I mean, like playing like night games in Europe, you're just yeah, like, this is mm -hmm. sick. And yeah. then getting to go watch the men play at Wanda, you're like... That's where you live for a lot of nice. players play. Yeah. yeah that's so good. What was the level like? Did you take a bit of time to get used to it or would you just found it pretty comfortable from the get-go? Definitely took some time to get used to it. Yeah. Like, I went from being the most technical player in the team to, like, nowhere near the Spanish players. So I really had to work hard at, at what I thought I was good at, what I was brought in to do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was a bit of a shock. I was like, oh, usually this is something I can rely on, but now it's... Now I've got players that are like way better. And I'm talking like Jenny Hermoso, who's like, what? She was Spain? on the team for Spain, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Like one of Spain's best players. Yeah. Like she's been in top three world players. Like she's, she's ridiculous. Um, I remember one of my first sessions, like just watching her in a rondo and I'm like, holy crap, she doesn't lose the ball. I yeah. think that whole season I got the ball of her once. <laughs> like no word of a lie, ridiculous with her feet. Um, so to get used to the level, like I was, I was happy with the way that I was able to not mess up the drills like obviously all in Spanish I just strategically put myself behind other people yeah, and try yeah, and just do the exact same thing watch what they do <laughs> like, watch what they do they know what they're doing yeah, yeah I'm like hopefully you guys yeah. know what's up um, there were some times where they didn't tell me it was one touch I'm like, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah like it, it took a little bit of time but once you're in that routine and um, you're used to you know everything being with the ball which is what I loved like I couldn't get enough of it I'd train and then I'd find a wall somewhere in a park nearby and like do extra stuff to try and get myself even more close to level. It's amazing. That's what I tell all the youngsters. Just 
Get a don't ball and a wall. Don't worry about warming up the glutes at six. Yeah, just get the ball. <laughs> nah, the no. It's a problem. Too much of this, that. Just play. <laughs> just to have fun. I know. Um, what would you say was the biggest challenge at Atletico Madrid? Was there a moment that you thought like, <laughs> holy crap? Um, yeah. I mean, I remember getting – so first month in, there was a point where, you know, I was getting games. Like I got my first start, first goal. I was like, hell yeah, what a start. Um, and then I remember not getting selected to travel for the Champions League match against Man City. And that was the first time I was left by myself without my teammates. And that's where the whole thing, like the whole routine of everything stopped. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like this is really real life now. Because, I mean, back home, like I was used to always playing, right? So I went from always playing to now I'm getting dropped completely from squads and not traveling. So that was the first bit that hit me. And then in the next bit that hit me was the second year. Uh, I had such a good preseason. The coach like came over and was like, you're going to be really important for us this season. I was getting like, you know, great minutes. It looked like I was going to start against Barcelona. Match day minus one. <laughs> we had this basically like a simple crossing and finishing drill. And we had so many international players, like 13 different nationalities. We had two Ukrainian players that didn't understand English or Spanish. Tough mix. Um, mm. But yeah, the drill was meant to be non-contact. They didn't get that memo. Oh, no. mm. So I'm going, you know, head down, about to cross the ball. She comes flying in, studs up, ball had just left my foot. Ball into ankle, studs into ankle. And I was like, oh, well, this this hurts a lot more than all the other tackles I've ever had. Oh. Um, so, yeah, being injured in Spain, 100% the hardest thing. Um, you can't do what you love. You're just sitting there. Well, yeah. yeah. Just, like I'm in a, <laughs> you're there to play football. Yeah, <laughs> in a different country, yeah. can't understand the people I'm working with. Yeah. And yeah, the doctor, like, you know, the things that you didn't think you'd have to face, like, it became really freaking tough. You ended up doing serious damage or? Um, it was, I was meant to be out for only a month, ended up being a year and a half. Jesus. Um, yeah, just what people the, having different views on what, what to do. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so. What did you actually uh, get diagnosed with? Um, I had like partial tear in my uh, deltoid. Um, so it wasn't meant to be that bad, but my yeah. feet are completely flat. So it rolls in constantly on that and just keeps straining it. Okay. Like, so it would just, but they got me like running pretty much straight away. So the way that we would have done things in Australia would have been quite different. This is from like the national team yeah, yeah, yeah. doctors and physios at the time. Um, but yeah, I was supposed to be in a boot. No, they had me kind of running straight away and putting a lot of load on it. And then I ended up getting like a massive edema, like a big sack of blood in my heel. I couldn't walk. I was in so much pain. Um, all the injections didn't help. I was getting needles in my ankle constantly, like yeah. things that just weren't helping. Mm. Um, and it took COVID for me to actually be able to come home, get proper treatment, start running again. And that was with Mike at Elite. Like literally Mike saved me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, literally <laughs> sh massive shout out to Mike because he caught me at like probably my lowest moment of just like, I've, yeah, dropped from World Cup. You feel like helpless too because your body's letting you down. Yeah. You don't know what's yeah, going yeah. on. Yeah. And then like then it's in COVID. I'm like, what the, f yeah. <laughs> what is happening to everything? Yeah. And I should be like getting to my prime and all of that. So that, all of that was kind of happening. Um, and then, yeah, then it became kind of tough because – COVID happened, so that rest of that season got taken away. Flipped to the next season, I still had another year on with my deal. Um, and I kind of went back to them and I was like, hey, I want to do rehab with what I got in Australia. Um, they didn't like that very much. So kind of punished me for that, for wanting to have like different medical view. Um, and yeah, pretty much rode the bench for, for six months. I had like offers, like loan offers to go to play for Sevilla and, and an offer in Germany to go. They did not want me to go. Um, they would only let me go back to Australia. So that's where my little stint with Melbourne City fell into place. Wow. Yeah. So once again, it's like that, all those little things that no one really sees. Yeah. Like you, you know? can be the hero and the enemy, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like with them, people don't realise like when you're with that club, like they have a lot of power over you too. Like you said, you had offers yeah, yeah. to go, but they're not going to let you go to a rival. People don't understand that. Oh, but just let him go. You're not playing. Yeah, but it's not that simple. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So okay. No, nah, it is. Yeah, it's very different. And then there's like that perception of like, you know, I think it's probably happened with some of the guys as well. Like the guys that have signed for Celtic and then come back on loan in the league. With like, Melbourne City. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, like, like it's kind of deemed as yeah. like a yeah. failure, right? So me coming back from Atletico Madrid 
not signing like another deal overseas and coming back to Melbourne City was deemed as a failure. Yeah. And right? then especially like from what they were saying before you left, it's yeah. like yourself thinking then here we go, now they're going to be like, you, know, you, you should have stayed that this, way? that. It felt like, it felt tough because I was like, I did not expect to be coming back to Australia that early. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was a little bit of a, it, it was tough, but then I was just very grateful to be playing again once I was over my injury. I'm like, when yeah. I started running, I was able to push myself again. I was like, I just miss playing. And yeah. that kind of reconnected me to why I play. And just didn't matter where I played. Um, if I was playing just in the park, doing whatever, or playing overseas, um, I just wanted to play. And Melbourne City gave me that opportunity to do that. Um, and yeah, they got me at like a time where I'd not played 90 minutes in two years. So they like really had to build me back up again um, from that point. There's nothing like that feeling of just enjoying football again. Uh, yeah. Like I know we we know because like <laughs> we we went through that of just that period of just hating it, mm. and just you want nothing to do with it. And then when that sparks ignited again, it's like everything's when football's good, life's good. But you yeah. realise that you never hated the actual game itself. No, it's, yeah. the crap, it's all the yeah. bullshit around <laughs> yeah. it. Because the, the game is what literally made me happy from when I was like yeah, this saying. big. You know yeah. what I mean? So, one question I had about Federico: Did you ever meet any of the the first, like the, the men's team play? Did you have any experience with them or just play like a game against them? Oh, I missed out on the game. Oh. So I had to get scans, which I was livid about. Yeah. Um, but I remember, I think it was photo day, we all at the, the Wanda. Um, and <laughs> I remember seeing Griezmann and being like, <laughs> like and he was like my phone, he was my phone case at the time. Like, <laughs> Like this is creepy, but <laughs> it is a bit weird. I'm just like, oh my god! Did he wave back? Um, no, but oh, no. <laughs> he was busy. He was training. It's fine. He's free. Um, <laughs> yeah. But um, I remember meeting Diego Costa. Um, oh, he was cool. a legend. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was big. He looks like a big clown. Oh yeah, yeah, funny, yeah. yeah. Like <laughs> just he doesn't look like a footballer. No, <laughs> no, no. Um, and then yeah, meeting Simeone, I was like, you are intimidating. As yeah, far. I was going like, to say. He'd be the coach. He's intimidating, but. I'd sort of love to play for a coach like that because yeah. I know yeah. that he's just going to lock you off you on that pitch. Oh, you know what I mean? 100%. He'll G you up as a player. It's like having another player. Yeah, give that extra. Yeah. But he would, I wouldn't want to get on his wrong side. No yeah. Way. Put it that way. Yeah. No like, so I think, yeah, it was really cool meeting them and no, stuff. Cool. Um, but yeah, we didn't have too much to do with them, especially when our venues got split up. So they yeah. stayed where we were beforehand and then we got moved to like a, a little smaller town, kind of 30 minutes out of the CBD. Um, but had a massive complex to ourselves. Just a female complex. Like female yeah. and academy, um, okay. kind of. Yeah. But like, yeah, our own pitch, wow. our own change rooms with, you know, names on it and everything. We got given cards. Like it completely really? changed that next year. Yeah. From there, victory. From there, city. City, sorry, city. And then, <laughs> and then Japan. <laughs> That's right, yeah. yeah. How was that experience like? <laughs> Why are you laughing? May my overseas career. Actually been actually been every, Mexico almost every, well. Mexico, been everywhere. But, America. Yeah. So <laughs> my overseas <laughs> career is a bit um <laughs> of an interesting one. So yeah, basically like maybe five games into playing with Melbourne City, I was like finding myself again. I was like, hell yeah, I, I wanna I wanna play overseas again. Um and signed with a new agent who I basically said to him, I'm like, you know, what about Japan? Because it was gonna be the first year that was gonna be professional. Um and yeah, just reached out through the through a random contact, and they were like, "Yeah, we're interested." Video again. No, not that, not that shady highlights <laughs> video. We made an updated one. <laughs> HD this time. <laughs> yeah, this one looked a little bit more proper. They've they've improved over the years. Um, but yeah, they they were interested. They offered me a two year deal, and it was good money for you know compared to what I was getting in Australia. I was like, that's actually pretty decent. You know, you get to play in Japan. They're right outside of Tokyo. Um, like I think Garrier, Jason Garrier was there oh, at the oh, time yeah, yeah. for the men's. So yeah. it was Jeff United. And I was like, this seems pretty cool. Super random, but like very me, you know, like Spanish football, Japanese football. It's me. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah this was <laughs> at a time as well. So once again, my decision to go to, to Japan was not very welcomed by the national team. They were like, kind of why are you going there you should be going somewhere to work on your physicality and I'm like yeah. standard yeah and I was like oh, <laughs> oh Japanese football is pretty so <laughs> I really want to go there um and yeah that was when I got I got dropped from the Olympics and this is yeah in that time as well multiple hotel quarantines but mm. went to Japan um did my two weeks hotel quarantine first session out with the team 
left wing back. I was like, this is a red flag. I made sure in all of my communication with the club, like they scouted me as a midfielder, like as a 10 or an 8. Mm-hmm. That's what my highlights video was. There was no mention <laughs> of left wing back. I didn't even know they played that system. So apparently in that two-week hotel quarantine period, they had decided to change the system that they wanted to play. And they had a, a thought that because I'm from Australia, I can run. <laughs> so I was like massively stitched up with that one. So I had my debut against the top team. And this is like one of the top female teams in the world. <laughs> debut at left wing back. <sighs> I was like, this is, I played 45 minutes. Horrific. Like it, yeah. like it was bad. Just we, up and down the whole time. It was, it was not, it was not it's a good time. Um, yeah. And I was just thinking like, surely not. Um, and, you know, in that period as well, I was asking the coach, you know, what can I do to like prove? Like every time I was playing in the midfield in training, thought I was doing really well. Mm-hmm. Once again, massive language barrier, other things to contest with, like not, you know, it was the first year of them being professional, but like I'm getting <laughs> like strapped out of a van on the side of the road. Like we didn't, we didn't have facilities. We didn't have our own gym. We were training on a synthetic pitch at a school. Like it was not professional yeah. in my mind but you know the pay the pay was there that side of it was there and mm. I was thinking the league's really good the players are really good mm. it's just the other stuff around it yeah. that we didn't have yeah. so it didn't bother me like I thought you know like I'll come here and, and give it a really good crack um but yeah I found out right before so this was the year that Asian Cup was on and the season was going to pause for three months massive break <laughs> so I was thinking like you know, after 11 games and it's a three-month break and then they continue. And I was like, well, I kind of want to play in that time if I'm not playing mm-hmm. in this time. So that's where the first me going on loan to victory happened. Um, and I appeared in maybe five of the 11 games, all basically left wing back. One time I was left wing, thought I did really well um, in 10 minutes that I was given. And I asked the coach, you know, like, why am I not playing? Like, change the team a lot not you know he was like you didn't score or assist <laughs> I'm like fair enough <laughs> cool um but yeah I did find out towards like right before I went on loan to victory that from a translator who came once a week um said you know in in Japan it's really disrespectful to ask questions mm-hmm. so I was essentially disrespecting him for two months no wonder I wasn't playing <laughs> yeah. um so in my mind I think you know you ask yeah. a coach you show you you want to play yeah, yeah. A bit um, of a weird way of looking at things. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, it just culture. wasn't yeah. wasn't at that, and you know none of the internationals were really having much of much luck um, yeah. playing playing over there that first season because of the cultural differences in that sense. Mm. So yeah, went over to victory um, to play once again, super low in confidence and just like I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and you know, going to a rival team like from <laughs> from city to victory, I was like, people are going to hate me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get anything um, thrown at you at the games or no? Nah. <laughs> Just a few comments on Instagram for a few, sure. Fair few comments, yeah, I reckon. Always a keyboard warrior. Yeah, yeah, love the keyboard warriors. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, just absolutely loved it. Clicked in with the team straight away. Coach was like, play how you want to play. Yeah. <laughs> this That's is why best. you're here. That's the best That's when you've got the, the confidence game. of the coach. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was really fortunate with that. And then I was doing really, really well. Um, and we were like, you know, we had this period because of – COVID where we had seven games in two weeks. So it was like That's heavy. It it was a lot. A lot yeah. Actually no, not seven games in two weeks. Sorry, that is like that's ridiculous. Seven games in three weeks, maybe? Three or still. yeah, it's still a lot. <laughs> yeah, two it's games a, a week, two and a half games a week. Yeah, it's not, it's yeah. it's not yeah. great. Um <laughs> but yeah, they really wanted to keep me for that that period because, you know, we're trying to push for finals. Mm. Um and yeah, my club in Japan's like, okay, we want you to come back now. And I was like am I actually going to play if I come back? And they flat out said, no, you won't play. So I'm like, like okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, you know, because I was hoping that they would watch me playing. Yeah. Like, you know, as yeah, a normal you loan, yeah. when yeah, you, you kept, what you think. They still own you. They want to yeah, keep an like, players. Yeah, I'm like, I'm playing like super well yeah. here mm-hmm. back home. I'm playing as a 10. Yeah. I'm proving what I can do. Um, and yeah, they didn't watch any of the games. Had no interest. Um, and then were happy to mutually terminate. So got the mutual termination and then signed the rest of the year with victory. Um, and yeah, it was, you know, I genuinely thought I'd be there for two years, but it ended up being three months. 
It's a great time. <laughs> just quickly, when will we stop thinking of Australian footballers as just like these physical leg breaking? Why can't we just be technical? When's that happen, you reckon? Mm. To be honest, I don't know, but it starts from the top, man. And I'm so got a long way to go. More of, mm-hmm. When I hear exactly what Alex has been saying this whole podcast just brings back a lot of memories. Yeah, I really don't know. I feel <laughs> like you just went rig it. it. Literally, <laughs> literally, like, we need to put a trigger warning. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> So many bad memories, anyway. Yeah. So victory? Yeah. So finished the season off, we yeah. won. Yeah. So, so I was like, this is epic. Like um, got player of the season, um, players player. Like So, you know, that was the best award because it's obviously voted by your teammates. I'm like, yeah, all right, I clearly made an impact on this team. I felt really loved there. Um, yeah, great end to the season. And then, uh, yeah, then the US popped up. So I was like, I am not going searching for a club, I'm going to just stay. And this team popped up, spoke with the scout um, of the team, and I was like, why do you actually want me to come? (laughs) And I could tell he'd actually watched me play for quite an extended period of time. Um, And this was for, you know, racing Louisville. They're in Kentucky in the US. Like still, like top flight NWSL, but um, relatively new club. And, you know, we're kind of trying to kind of like sell their vision um, European coach, the Swedish coach. So they were just like, they were selling a great vision. And I really had to consider it because I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to go overseas again after my last two experiences. Um, but at the same time, very, like pretty much before I got that offer, it was announced that Australia would be hosting the World Cup. And I was like, I, I need to make that team. Mm-hmm. And clearly they want me in the US. <laughs> so I can prove that I'm physical. So I decided to go purely to try and give my best. Like I was like, this is my last shot at trying to make the team because I've been dropped from the Matildas like so many times since I was, you know, 15. It's been like a 10-year period where I've been in the team, out of the team, in the team, out of the team. So I was like, this is my last time trying for a tournament. Like it's a home World Cup. You can't get bigger than that. I need to do everything possible. And if this team in the US is going to help me with that, Let's try. Mm. So I <laughs> packed my stuff up again and I went went to live in Kentucky. Um, what was that like? <laughs> very interesting. Is that, like all talk Is that the accent? Oh, I don't. Oh, the accent's just. Would have been hard to get used to. Classic huh? American. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> like, look, my teammates there, like, I made some really awesome friends. Um, and our SNC, she was the old um, Man City women's SNC. That's so really she cool. was a legend. Had some great people at that club. Um, but I just, I don't, I don't think I have a lot of luck with Swedish coaches, <laughs> it turns yeah, really. out. Um, first year, honestly, was was all right. Like, I, But once again, I wasn't playing as a midfielder. I was playing as a left winger. So I'm like, why do I keep getting scouted as a 10? I'm clearly playing my best in this spot. I'm getting scouted scouted. by clubs and then I'm getting put in different positions. Is this because of your size? What, what's the reason? Because oh, no, I, I feel it. like this used to happen to like me a lot as being yeah. a central midfielder when I was younger because I was small mm. and it's like just stick him out, out wide. Yeah, that's like Always, the, because he's small. Honestly, yeah. I was it's like, like, man, I don't, I don't need to use my body. Give me, yeah. give me the ball on my feet and I'll show you, man. Like, you know what I, mean? I was thinking because, you know, I'm left footed. They're just like, okay, we don't have a left footer. You're, you're Australian, you're going to run. Like, I think yeah. it's just, I honestly think yeah, it's like the same thing, stigma, right? Sort of thing. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a stigma that kind of carried on. So, Gop was a left winger. Um, didn't love it, but, you know, was playing, kept the ball. Um, was trying the best I can. Obviously, I wasn't making those darting runs in behind. But that first season, I had um, US national team left back behind me. So she would go. I would just chill in the middle. <laughs> it actually worked for that first season. She left the next season. <laughs> um, but yeah, once again, things that were kind of out of my control. So so I signed that first year in the US and I was like, it needs to be a one plus one. I'm not signing a two-year deal mm-hmm. based on all of my other experiences. And they're like, that's completely fine. Um, and I also said, I need to be playing, I need to finish the season and then join back up with victory, play that full season and then join back in preseason. Cause I need to play as many games as possible for my best shot at making a world cup squad. They agreed to those terms as well. Um, so as soon as the season finished in the U S went straight back into victory, no preseason, just straight back into playing. So it was like nonstop from that last season, straight in and then straight in again, um, played, I was technically on loan, played um, 14 games of the season um, when, yeah, I think it was the games were like 22 games or 20 games at the time. 
um, then went straight back over to the US, got three weeks of preseason, and then season began. Um, in this time, they decided that because I wasn't there for all of preseason, they didn't want to play me. So <laughs> I was like, why am I coming back? Yeah. I was just playing like, once again, like my best football. This is the best football I'm playing. And I found out that I won like player of the year, like for the league in 14 games. <laughs> I have done everything I possibly can. And because I wasn't there all preseason, they're going to punish me for that. So I'm like, why? why? Yeah, it's not like you were doing nothing. I, I don't know. Yeah, so um, it was a bit frustrating, as you can imagine. And, you know, they made a whole bunch of new signings and new players they want to give opportunities to. So I was like, okay. So, yeah, they kind of told me I'm only going to play in the cup games. I thought I did really well in the cup games. Still not enough to, to actually play. Um, so I was really worried at that point about if I'll make the World Cup squad or not. But I guess I'd done enough in the camps as well as, you know, the season before in the US and season with victory to make it um, at that point. But, yeah, it was what started off, like, quite good and something that I was very hesitant to go to because it was the US and just didn't suit my style of play. Ended up being one of the better experiences up until that next year where things kind of crumbled again, not football related. So. Yeah. It's funny, like, Everyone's a bit of an expert on where they think players should go, clubs, teams or whatever, but mm. there's so much that goes into it. Like you said, like if it doesn't suit you, it doesn't matter like what club you go to. If the mm. coach doesn't play a system that suits you, yeah. it's so hard to then really play your game. It's also having the faith, exactly. I think, of the staff mm -hmm. yeah. that you then can do what you got to do because yeah. then you feel like they believe in you, yeah. so then you have that belief in yourself, you know. But So then did you go to Mexico after that? Yeah, so did the World Cup. And then kind of had like another, another. So I had to organize this like throughout the World Cup period. So I had a chat when I was leaving. So I was like really trying to make sure that I was going to do the whole pre lead up to the World Cup. I wanted to be in basically right in front of Tony to be like, you have to pick me. <laughs> so I told um, team in the US, I'm like, guys, if you're not going to play me, please just let me go and try and make a World Cup squad. Like I am doing everything I possibly can. And you know, the facilities there, unbelievable. I can just go use that facility whenever I want. Um, same for the men and the women. We get fed there. Perfect. So I, because I wasn't playing, me and like my small group that also weren't playing, we would go and just train all the time. <laughs> like go do our own sessions, go do our own gym sessions. Like the amount of box to box runs I did. Oh, um, I was like going crazy to try and prepare for this yeah like pre-World Cup camp. Um, and yeah, luckily, because Tony had some time at the in the US national team, he knew the guy had that had just taken over um, Racing Louisville and like they had a discussion and they allowed me to go. But basically, once again, you know, I wasn't going to play if I returned. So I'm, you know, I'm there at the World Cup being like, I'm not going to play after this period for the rest of the year. What do I do? Um, and yeah, they weren't, they put like a really high transfer fee on me. So there were clubs, once again, the clubs that were interested, but they weren't going to pay that much when I had six months of my contract left. Um, so they agreed cause they had a really good relationship with this Mexican club that I can go there on loan. So it was like a loan, but like it was up until the end of my contract. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so yeah, ended up, that's kind of how we sold it as a loan. So I went on loan to Mexico, um, but yeah, signed there and their season runs in like four months, break four months. So I would do a whole season because it's not like halfway through the season, you do like a whole season in four months and then you break and then you do another whole season. Um, yeah. So yeah, I did that period like and once again, <laughs> not playing as a midfielder, um, playing as a winger. <laughs> um, and yeah, like, and the feedback that I got, cause, cause I knew Spanish, right. I could actually talk with them. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was just like, we want you to be direct. And I'm like, you know that I'm not direct, yeah, exactly. like, yeah. you know, that I want to just like, you know, so I've not quite found my fit overseas. And that's why I laughed at the beginning of like, it's just been, been tough thinking that, you know, places like Spain, Japan, and Mexico, more my style of football, there's this perception that I'm play like all the other girls in the Australian national team. I think you need to go to Italy, cheese. Yeah, I reckon. That's sweet, yeah. Get me there, mate. Milan. <laughs> Make some focus. Yeah. 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 Which one you want, Milan or Inter? <laughs> 
That's a, that's a loaded question on this pod. So be careful. Yeah, be careful. Look, I was going to say uh, Milan. Yeah, Get out. Smart girl. Well, it's, it's my initials, AC Milan. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And that's black fair. and red, I'll classic. Take that, I'll take that as well. Absolutely classic. Maybe I get to train you again. <laughs> would, would love it. Um, <laughs> what was living in Mexico like? It was cool. Like, I actually really enjoyed it. Um, so I was in Monterey. Altitude, not a fan. In Mexico, yeah. so lots of places yeah. I played in, I could not breathe to save my <laughs> yeah. life. Um, but yeah, like it was very different than the other places. So I'd be catching Ubers to training. Didn't like driving there. No, yeah, I <laughs> could imagine. Oh. <laughs> I am not going to drive. Like my first one I arrived, I'm like, I am not <laughs> driving here for three months. <laughs> um, so yeah, Ubers were super cheap. So I ended up taking Ubers to training and stuff. Where I lived was deemed as one of the richest neighborhoods in all of Mexico. Um, but I was, I'd, I opted to live in an Airbnb, um, and it's kind of like a share house situation. So I had the host and another person that comes in and out like, like me, mm-hmm. um, cause I wanted to have more of that like local feel. An authentic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm here for three months. I want to actually experience living in Mexico yeah. and like get taken out by locals instead of get an apartment really close to training, which is not in a place where there's anything there. You're just going to go up and lock training back to the apartment. Yeah, I didn't want that again after having that for so long. So I wanted it to be very different. And I basically said to myself, this doesn't work out. I am committing to Australia for multiple years because I just want to play. I missed it. I miss playing so much. And I'm kind of sick of, you know, going out and doing all this extra training and it not going anywhere. Like, you know, when I do that here and I play, I do really well. And... I want to. I want that feeling more often, and I want to continue to develop. So it's kind of where we ended up on. <laughs> Keep at it. Well, well, a few years should be at Milan. Yeah, we're working on it. We're working on it. We're working on it. Sorry about Milan. Hey, I would love to. I've always said I want to play in Italy. That's on my there list. So hey, that's, next one. <laughs> that's right. I want to touch on the amazing work you do off the pitch too. What sparked that side <laughs> of things? And can you give us a quick? Run down on what yeah, we'll do. try and be quick. Yeah. Um, so I guess what sparked it, a little bit of just growing up um, in like a very European Polish household. So spending a lot of time with my grandma, seeing how much she did for her community, like her little Polish community in Adelaide. Um, absolutely loves it. I mean, she gave back to her community by feeding them. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, I was like, oh, how can I give back to my community? And a lot of it was, you know, through football. So, um it actually happened when I was in in Spain. So that first year when I was feeling really isolated, I noticed for the first time, like I don't have my community around me. Like I don't have that extra connection and that's really affecting me off the field. So um, that's where I joined up with Common Goal and where I pledged 1% of my my wage to a, a charity overseas that uses football to, to educate like people on life skills essentially. Um, but I loved the concept of using football for good and got really attached to that. And it gave me a little bit more of a higher purpose, especially when I wasn't playing. And, um, yeah, the people that I've met through that have just been so amazing. And, um, yeah, a lot of the work that I do now, a lot of the volunteering work, it's all, you know, I get to go out and have a kick with people, but we're like connecting and talking about real things. And it's like the really pure side of football that I fell in love with, um, so, yeah, you know, any help that I can kind of give back whenever I'm home and, and now that I am home, it's great because I get to do so much more. Um, a lot of it used to just be virtual, jumping on calls and talking to kids or talking to um, other community groups um, or giving insight into certain things. But, yeah, did ended up studying a cert for in youth work, um, want to study something in community development as well because – that's definitely where the the passion lies. I'd love to have a community center where I can just get kids to just come play and, um, you know, have a safe space. Um, and yeah, there's so many of those amazing things like out there spread around the world. Um, and yeah, I'd love to bring something like that to Australia, but it's freaking competing with all these other sports is hard here. <laughs> but, um, it's funny you say that because we've, we've mentioned the same thing. That's uh, another big reason yeah. about football in this country. Like you think about, you've been around the world. You look yeah. everywhere. There's five or five pitches. Com- <laughs> yeah. it's a, that's a community in yeah. itself. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. You know, and, and we've always felt like there's nothing here. There's yeah. that's why kids don't play on the street anymore. Yep. Like they don't do anything because there's no way for them to actually go and play. And they turn to doing dumb shit. Yeah, yeah. You know, hundred percent. Like so true. I, yeah, when I was on holiday in um, Bangkok, like partner and I literally stumbled across like a field. There's kids playing, and yeah. I asked if I could play, and then so I ended best. up encouraging like other adults to play, and it was just like. 
so wholesome. Like we're just yeah. playing and like, you know, connecting all these different people together through this game. Like absolutely yeah, that, love it. That's, that's all goosebumps stuff there. Look, yeah. I know it sounds stupid, but that's why football for me is the best sport yeah. in the world because you can go to any corner of the globe. Mm. You don't even know what they're saying to yeah. each other. You're just like, hey, football, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Boom, you're like best mates. Yeah. 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 It's like it's unbelievable. It's a beautiful you know what I mean? That, that, that's yeah. literally the beautiful game. Like that's yeah. why they call it that. Yeah, yeah. It's very special what you do. So yeah. we commend you. And if there's anything we can do to help, please. Oh man, we just gotta we gotta find a space and yeah. build a fire make it, pitch. literally yeah. build a fire. <laughs> yeah. That's like my honestly my dream. Like that would be good. That would be amazing. So sick. Yeah. <laughs> what's next for Chid? What's the what's the goals? What's next? Yeah, I guess in this period, um, now that I am home, so I, I did, I signed the two, two and a half year deal with Melbourne Victory. Um, so that first half year has been completed. So joined back at the back end of their season um, last season. And now I'm in the longest off season of my life. <laughs> like I'm so used to just season's done. I'm into another season. And now I'm like, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> like went on my first holiday and um yeah, like I'm trying to to figure out now how to use my time really wisely and tap into the things that, you know, when I was overseas, I didn't get to do much of, which was a lot of that community stuff. Um, I want to make sure I do that with my time here in the off season. So, um, yeah, part of my days, I'm a, I'm a support worker. So that's, I guess, my first job other than football now, which is kind of cool. Um, never had another job. I've always just been a professional footballer. So now I'm, I guess, a support worker too, which is cool. Um, and just trying to upskill in that area a little bit. And, um, now, you know, I've also in this 10 years I've been playing, I've never had any sponsorships. So it was kind of working on, you know, my image outside of football and what I can do, um, in terms of partnering with really cool brands. So, um, just partnered with 2XU, um, which is a brand obviously I've been using forever, like first compressions that I bought and everything. Yeah. Um, but the big thing for me when wanting to connect with other brands is like, okay, how can we use this? to then help the community and they were so open to like, you know, instead of like, for me, I don't need $4,000 worth of product. Like what am I going to do with that? But if we can then partner with the big issue and it's like the women that I work with every Thursday for our street soccer program, we can provide jackets. Like I don't okay. need all this stuff to myself. And they were one of the first brands that were like, yes, let's do it. You know, it mm -hmm. doesn't have to just be, I get given mass amount of product just for myself. So we're just trying to like open up and look at different ways that I can now use, I guess, my platform to then help the broader community around here um, in Melbourne. So awesome. that's, that's I guess, the next little project. Um, a shit ton of training as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, currently five days in a row, double sessions most days, um, and then keeping the weekends free so I have a bit of a life and um, get to, you know, actually be with my girlfriend after five years of long distance. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. um, yeah, so there's that and getting to watch her play plays with your girlfriend, yeah, funnily enough. Does, so, <laughs> so small world, but, um, yeah, now it's like a bit of a role reversal. Like now I get to come and watch her play <laughs> yeah. her following me around everywhere. But yeah. Instead of playing, going to watch you at Atletico Madrid, you go to Clifton Park in Brunswick. Exactly. Same thing. Exactly the same thing. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, if you had any advice for young footballers, not only girls, but just footballers yeah. in general trying to make it, what would it be? I think honestly the big one for me, and like you hear lots of people say it, um, you know, you just, you just got to make sure it's fun, right? And that to a certain extent, yes. Um, I think you're going to come across like points where you can either choose the easy way or the hard way. I've spent most of my career choosing the hard way. And I'm now at a point of like realizing why I wanted to play in the first place again. So um, I think for young players, like what, why do you actually play the game? Like knowing why you actually play the game is going to be able to guide you wherever you want to be. So if you actually want to be one of those top players, you're going to have to go down like these really difficult paths sometimes. So if you want to just be playing because you absolutely love the game, maybe there are different decisions you take. And for, for me, like, I seemingly have taken a step backwards because I'm not playing overseas, but I am exactly where I need to be to be playing my best football. And I'm super ambitious still, and I want to be playing um, as much football as I can. And that's why I've chosen to stay where I am because it's with a coach that lets me do that. Um, so, yeah, I think you're not going to – sometimes you're not going to find – you're not going to be at a club where everything's going to go right. There are so many clubs out there. Like yeah. there are so many different environments, so many people that you can meet. 
something will work out. It's about finding that. And, you know, I'm, I'm living proof. I've gone overseas to four different countries. It's not worked. <laughs> and Because you haven't gone to Italy. Exactly. Because <laughs> I haven't gone to Italy. Um, but, you know, what's worked for me now is like, yeah, something that I was fighting against when I was younger because that was my, my little bias of overseas is better. But I actually play my best football here. So why would I? Sometimes you need to go backwards, go forwards. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it's not, it's not going to be super yeah. linear. Yeah, like, exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> it has been a long time coming. I have to get the Pope on, really. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got close calls with him anyway. So. Pope, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's been an absolute pleasure, Chids, and an honor for us. So thank you heaps for coming nah, thank on. You. Thank you. It was a great well. chat. Thank you to everyone listening at home. If you haven't already, please follow us on Spotify. We're getting heaps of listens, but not as many followers. So make sure you click follow. YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. TikTok. I don't know, every other social media. Send us an email. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, just Just send us a letter in the post and we'll get back to you. (laughs) Um, Thank you heaps. We'll see you next episode.